So let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for this morning, for another opportunity to open your word and to look at um, the past as well as the present. We pray that uh, you can help each of us in our daily struggles um, with the fears and the worries that we could have, uh, that the difficulties that come our way that distract us. We just ask, Lord, that our minds can be focused upon these things and that you can speak to our heart um, and that you can strengthen us to follow and serve you that we may reflect your character in all the things that we do. Uh, be with us now through thy spirit and teach and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. And we're going to be looking at the Sunday Law. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> first thing here, I just wanted to look at uh, this article um, in Future for America, August 1998, the one entitled Sunday's Coming, which we didn't really get to read yesterday. Newspapers around the country emphasize the Pope's most recent apostolic letter, which calls for Sunday worship. The Detroit News titled their article, Pope's Call for Worship Welcomed. The article quoted a Catholic woman, or should be a Catholic woman, singular, who has been working a late shift on Saturday night as saying, I want to go back to the old ways where Sunday was the Lord's Day. I agree with the Pope. I want that life again. The article then quotes the director of Call to Holiness, a Detroit lay group that promotes Catholicism as saying, this appears to be the strongest words the Pope has ever issued, period. In the Pope's letter, he states that any violator of Sunday should be punished as a heretic. Archbishop Geraldo Magella and Agnello, Agnello Speaking on the part of the document which was dedicated to the Sunday Sabbath issue stated, we must say right away that the Holy Father has said nothing new concerning the seriousness and the possible excuses with regard to such obligation. He reminds us what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, those who deliberately fail in this obligation commit a grave sin. Bishop Piero Marini, who was also with the Pope to explain the apostolic letter entitled Des Domini, the day of the Lord, pointed out making Sunday holy is placed above all in the framework of the preparation for the great jubilee of the year 2000. The Pope indicates Sundays as a qualifying element of the identity of a Christian and of the church which is presented to the generation of the new millennium. The better one celebrates Sunday, he added, the better the jubilee the better one celebrates Sunday, he added, the better the Jubilee will be celebrated. In the letter, after discussing the current conception of Sunday as simply being part of the weekend, the Pope stated, Sunday is something much different. It is the weekly day in which the church celebrates the resurrection of Christ. In obedience to the, obedience to the third commandment, Sunday must be sanctified. Ready or not, Sunday is coming. Now, does anybody here know why he's quoting from this Detroit news and the significance of that. Um, anybody know what I'm talking about? Why don't you clarify it? Well, I wish I could remember, and I'm trying to remember. I was hoping somebody would remember. But there was something about this article in the Detroit news um, that was questioned, um, and I can't remember what it is, and I, I can't find it. I thought somebody might know what I'm talking about. Um, maybe somebody who's watching these videos later on can can uh, remind us. But 
I know there is something to do with the way that this was originally reported um, in this Detroit newspaper that um, was questioned because they were uh, translating this article uh, because it was originally in Latin. That's my understanding. Now, um, so there's so there's a number of things about this that uh, does anybody know the date that this was Des Domini was uh, published? So I'm trying to get your guys' help here. Right, not yet, but I'll look it up. Yeah, um, I have a feeling that it was July seventh. Um, so. which of course is an interesting date, but um, I could be wrong. Uh, it says here, uh, May 31st, 1998 on- uh, Correct, that's what I've got. But somewhere I'd seen um, July 7th when I was looking at this earlier. So I'm not sure what that was referring to it must be referring to something. Um, so, so anyway, this is very recent. So this is the August 1998 Future for America issue. And, and he's reporting on this. And, and I have a feeling that there was something that was published on July 7th uh, that was connected to this. Um, so that's what I'm trying to figure out uh, there. And so May 31st is when Des Domini is, is originally published um, in 1998. And then they're going to report on this. Uh, maybe it was the Detroit News was July 7th. Ah, that's what it is. This is it. Um, here, so I'm going to show you this as soon as I open it up. I probably should have got this prepared earlier if I'd been really thinking about it. Um, so this is what I'm referring to, that's July 7th. So this was published on July 7th, the Des Domini, Pope John Paul II calls for national Sunday laws. And I think that there was, um, people who actually say that this whole article was overstated, um, that things were taken out of context or mistranslated. That's what I remember. Um, so anyway, it's going to have some things in here. So I'm, I'm going to try to find that out, but it's just something that I started thinking about as we were reading through it. So this is a 92 page document. I'll send this to people. Uh, I'm sure everybody would like to have it. Um, so we're not going to go through this right now. But the issue that we have happening in 1998 is this the publication of this um, uh, what, apostolic letter, right? Um, so it says there's this official English translation of that document below. Um, so I was hoping somebody would remember a bit about this, but uh, the point that we have right now is in 1998, with all the events that had happened in 1989 and of the progression of what was happening in the Catholic church and in the evangelical world, Adventists are looking for this coming Sunday law. And, and I remember it quite well, uh, the discussions about these things. Um, uh, a lot was made about this, this uh, Pope John Paul apostolic letter. And this is what Adventists were, were looking at. And this is what Jeff is looking at. Now, I'm, I'm going to go to the whiteboard before we actually start looking into uh, his review of the Sunday Law from Daniel chapter 11. <clears throat> Now, 
Now, to try to understand the lines on how they are developing. So you have 1798, you have Millerite history. Right, we'll just do it this way. You got the first angel, the second, and the third. And then you have the third angel, which is here, is going to continue all the way through this history. So Jeff understands that the third angel has arrived here. And then what he's going to look at is that in 1989, he, he knows that this is a repeat of the time of the end. And he has some idea that the first and second angel's messages are going to be repeated, that this is a repeat of Millerite history. He hasn't worked out the details. And so what he sees coming is that there's going to be a Sunday law. And then there's going to be the loud cry. And then there's going to be the close of probation. But his focus is on the coming Sunday law. Now, of course, 9-11 is not here. And he's looking at an event that to him is still future when the angel of Revelation 18 is going to come down. Now, where would Jeff place the coming down of the angel of Revelation 18? In 1998, where would he have placed that? Undoubtedly at the Sunday law. Yeah, so he would place it here at the Sunday law. Right, so he's going to be looking for Revelation 18 here. Now, we read yesterday from Notebook 3 that he saw that Islam was going to precede this Sunday law. So he wasn't seeing uh, Islam as connected to Revelation 18 like we did later with 9-11. What he sees is in his study of the trumpets is he knows that the seventh trumpet began to sound here. And during the seventh trumpet, you're going to have the third woe. And he sees the third woe, and, and we're going to look at this in more detail, as um, this uh, doubling. Uh, uh, he, he's not wording it that way at that time, but he sees that the elements of the first and second woe are going to be tied up in the elements of the third woe, a triple application of prophecy which is something that uh, is clearly taught by Lewis F. Weir, not in connection with the third woe, but in connection with other, other prophecies. So the Sunday law is, is the important thing here. Now, who are the players that Jeff is looking at when it comes to the Sunday law? So who is he watching here? Well, yeah, so he's watching the papacy, okay, and he's also watching the Protestants, <clears throat> and then who else is he watching? The United Nations. So he's looking at the UN, right? So he's not looking at Russia, because Russia is gone out of the way, right? So in, in Daniel chapter 11, he's looking at, here you have the king of the south is victorious over the king of the north. Whoops. And then you're going to have here, the king of the north is victorious over the king of the south. So to him, the king of the north, the king of the south issue is all gone. Now, how else would he describe the papacy, the Protestants, and the UN? What would be uh, words that he would use to describe them? You mean other than the three gold Well, yeah, but just individually. Beast, dragon, and false prophet. Or okay. Yeah, so you're going to have the beast. Be 
this is called to pop it in the bag. And right now, the dragon power is uh, what other ways that could we look at this? The papacy, it, would we say the papacy is Babylon? Or would we say this is all Babylon? <laughs> Can we say that the papacy is Babylon? Definitely. Okay. Now our and I think you said yeah. it's all Babylon. Right. So the Protestants become part of Babylon as well. But they become part of Babylon after the papacy is already Babylon. Because the papacy is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, right? So this is just, we could say this is a daughter, right? Now, what about the dragon power? How does it become a part of Babylon? Is it part of Babylon? Or can we give it a different name? Depending on where we are. Because what if we gave it the name Egypt? Would that be correct? Yes, we've already been discussing that. Okay. So, so this is Egypt. Now, if this is Babylon, is this the king of the north? No. And is this the king of the south? Now, there we have a little bit of a question. We just said that Russia was the king of the south and they were dead. Right. So Russia was the king of the south in 1989. But at the time of the Sunday law, is there still a king of the south? And how would we understand that? I had been saying no all the way up to 2014. Right. So this is something we still, we still haven't settled on. But we can see that we do use Egypt as a symbol of the UN. And we do see that we use Babylon as a symbol of, the, of both the, the beast and the false prophet. Now, they're all part of Babylon because Egypt is going to be conquered by Babylon. Does that make sense in this scenario at the end of the world? Yes. It's okay. the terminology. So in order for that to happen, there has to be a future battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, where the north is going to be victorious over the south. So that at the end, these then are all Babylon. Okay. Right. So, so there's still things that I'm, I'm thinking about, but it just in a simple way, I don't know why I spell daughter that way. There we go. Um, we can see that, that this, this definitely applies. Now we know then um, that, that the papacy has to con conquer three obstacles. Now, the way that Jeff has placed it is that what is conquered in 1989? So what's the first obstacle here? The USSR. Yeah. So, so you're going to have the USSR. And the USSR is, is this power here, right? I mean, it's the king of the south. So it's Egypt. So it's going to conquer Egypt in this context. And then it's going to conquer the glorious land, right? And the con conquering of the glorious land is here. And then it's going to conquer. Now, I think I always keep doing this wrong. 
So it's going to conquer uh, the wall of national sovereignty. The yeah. UN, basically. So what's the third one it conquers? Yeah, the UN has independent nations. Okay, so so we're going to say here that it's going to be the UN is the third one. Now, I think we're doing something wrong because I think I always do this wrong. Um, because the three powers is it has to conquer the Soviet Union, has to conquer the United States, and I guess the UN, that's, that could be correct. Uh, but the UN is who? Who is it conquering? conquering? If this is Egypt, is this Egypt as well? well? That's the terminology that we use, but yes, maybe a little unclear. So, so that's what we, we need to understand here, is how we we address this um, this conquering, this three uh, obstacles, because this obstacle appears to be the same as this obstacle. And this, anybody else have any suggestions about this? Is there something I'm doing wrong? I have a feeling that there is, but. Well, we obviously need to be clearer with our terminology. What does Egypt mean and what does the King of South mean? Okay, well, well, let's look at, at Daniel chapter 11 again. <coughs> uh, because Jeff is now going to go through this. Um, <coughs> yeah, I got to go back here a bit. So this is the part we had started studying, the impending Sunday law. And uh, we looked at, you know, Miller's apology and defense dealing with the Battle of Plattsburgh. And then we started reading uh, about um, the United States being God's chosen nation. Uh, it's God's chosen people were brought out of the land of Egypt, brought to the promised land. Um, and then these comparisons uh, that we have with the United States and God's chosen people, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church that are in the United States. Um, Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893, when the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for his people, that they might worship him according to the dictates of their own consciences, the land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread, the land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ, when that land shall, through its legislators, abjure the principles of Protestantism and give countenance to Romish apostasy and tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the man of sin will be revealed. So Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893. That statement um, is addressing the whole issue of the Sunday law from the point of the time of the end in 1798. That's where God has provided this, this land, um, the United States, as the promised land and has placed God's people there. So it's an asylum for his people. But at some point, it's going to go against all of the principles of Protestantism through its leg legislators, right? So that means there's going to be a law that is going to undo uh, the principles of Protestantism and enforce Sunday, right? So this idea of the Sunday law is what we believe a Seventh-day Adventist is going to come. The Lord has done more for the United States than any other country upon which the sun shines. Here he provided an asylum for his people where they could worship him according to the dictates of conscience. Here, Christianity has progressed in its purity the life-giving doctrine of the one mediator between God and man has been freely taught. God designed that this country should ever remain free for all people to worship him in accordance with the dictates of conscience. He designed that its civil institutions in their expansive production should represent the freedom of gospel privileges. Uh, that's from Maranatha 193. America, where the, where the greatest light from heaven has been shining upon the people, can become the place of greatest peril and darkness because the people do not continue to practice the truth and walk in the light. 
Selected Messages, Book 3, 387. The people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countenance to popery, the measure of their guilt will be full, and national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of this, of this apostasy will be national ruin. Review and Herald, May 2nd, 1893. Our land is in jeopardy. The time is drawing on when its legislators shall so abjure the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Romish apostasy. The people for whom God has so marvelous, marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will by a national act, give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, and thus arouse the tyranny, which only waits for a touch to start again into cruelty and despotism. With rapid steps, we are already approaching this period. So here we can see that this, this Sunday law, from the perspective of 1998, reading this, what are we expecting? What is Jeff expecting to happen? Next. The imminent implementation of the Sunday Law. Yeah, this is 1998. So what happened in 2001, we're looking at three years later, uh, we believe that the attack on the United States by Islam was to give us more time that a Sunday law was indeed imminent in 1998. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Now, it's hard for us to see that uh, by what happened. Um, now, a number of things that was, that was happening in 1998 and that happened even, even by the year 2000. So why would... Can we look back at that history and can we see that a Sunday law was indeed coming? Or is it something that we just can't see? That we uh, yes, can't see? Uh, by the strength of the, the moral majority was really ascending in, in power, political power. Mm -hmm. Now, what did 9-11 do that then would have stopped the Sunday law? So you have, you have the moral majority, you have um, definitely this movement, which would be a, you know, evangelical movement, uh, all of this uh, ecumenism going on. So all these churches breaking down their walls of differences and trying to unite, um, under a common belief system of which the Catholic Church was setting itself up as the mother church. Um, the question is, how did 9-11 stop a Sunday law? How would it have impeded a Sunday law? Because wouldn't you think it had actually increased the chances of a Sunday law happening? You know, well, we weren't looking for the scenario of uh, the Sunday law coming because of fear, but uh, at that time we were thinking, you know, just uh, you know, Christians would take over the government and then implement a Sunday law uh, as a sign of their power, not as a result of any kind of collective fear factor. Yeah, so you would think that uh, the catastrophe of 9-11 would actually speed up the progress of a Sunday law if you're just looking at the fear factor element, right? Now, I noticed back in 2001, because um, back then I had a TV, um, and, you know, TV was pretty vile. Um, but the day after 9-11, Things had changed quite a bit. America was, nobody was concerned, except maybe a few radical people, about the public prayer that was going on, uh, the call back to God that was going on. 
9-11 definitely shook a lot of people um, awake. And you would think that this would have helped bring about a Sunday law, that there would have been this call that the, you know, the United States has departed you know, from its principles and this attack happened you know, because we weren't following God. Now we need to follow God. And some of that language was used. Um, so why didn't it lead to a Sunday law? What was it about 9-11 that hindered any plans for a Sunday law? And, and think also about, you know, what happened with uh, uh, the Patriot Act, because that was already being prepared prior to 9-11. So now you have the Patriot Act and uh, you had the war on terror. Um, how were these things hindering a Sunday law? It was basically exposing the work that had gone on in darkness in the march toward the new world order. Okay, so, so, because what happened to the moral majority and to that sort of move towards Sunday after 9-11? What changed in the United States and in the world? You're sort of alluding to it here a bit. Yeah, they were pretty much forgotten. Okay, yeah, they were pretty much forgotten. But the question is why? The, the new fear of Islam. Okay, the new fear of Islam. Um, but, but if you had the memorial majority and you have this fear of Islam, would there be a rallying around Christianity in opposition to Islam and Sunday sacredness, wouldn't that have been something to rally around? Wouldn't you have seen a push for Sunday? So why did you not see a push for Sunday? Why was there this change? It, it seemed to me that rather than getting a, a rallying around Christianity, there was a rallying around the U.S. government who was going to smack Islam. And if you were not in favor of the Gulf War, then you couldn't be a good Christian either. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't live in the United States, I, and I wasn't following the news too much. Um, but did Americans really wake up at 9-11 about something else that was happening? Because what did the Patriot Act, Patriot Act do to, uh, to many Christians? What were Christians, um, I mean, initially you have this response, yes, Islam is the enemy. But what happened as time progressed? At least this is my perception. What was, what was happening to Christianity? Um, well, the Patriot Act seemed to be designed to address terrorism abroad uh, that would, they were afraid it would come into the United States. Okay. What about the freedoms that America's, Americans had experienced prior to 9-11? Were they taken away by the Patriot Act? Yes. And were Americans starting to become aware that the government uh, was controlling them? It took time. Yeah, so there's a few things that happened. What, what else happened in, in regard to, um, because you start to see a move towards, away from evangelical Christianity and, and large government to a much more uh, libertarian and, and, and small c conservative ways of looking at things. So uh, what, what two people exposed what was happening? Um, in the United States with our, with our liberties. The, the name Dillis Shafley comes to mind. Well, I don't know that name. But what about Snowden? Well, he was much later, wasn't he? Well, he's later. And then the other guy, what's his name? Yeah, I know. I'm talking about later. And the other guy, what was his name? Uh, uh, I can't think of it. Um, 
I'm so bad with names of things. Um, and he was releasing all these, uh, especially around the time of Trump and even before he ended up, uh, he was in asylum in... Uh, uh, Assange. Julian Assange. Assange. So what, what do you think was happening also with the internet? How do you think the internet uh, information uh, that was going on, what do you think this was doing to Americans? Um, because I think that Americans, in a sense, were much more united and Christians were much more united before 2001 than after. And, and the question is, what caused this? So part of it, we could say, is the Internet. Um, the 9-11 conspiracy theories. Um, how did that affect things? People began to distrust the government. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's now 9 11 originally was um, the conspiracy theory. We really originally was a leftist conspiracy theory. Um, that is, um, because George Bush was president, uh, the ones who initially brought about the conspiracy theory were leftists. And then later, um, it became a, a, a right wing conspiracy theory. You know, once you had Obama in power. So, um, so there was a change of that, but there was this distrust of government that was happening. There was all this information warfare. And so, you know, and I still ask myself the question, if there, if there was going to be a Sunday law and we were working up towards a Sunday law, 9-11 in a sense woke people up. Many people became Christians, but they weren't interested in bringing about a Sunday law that is Christianity was changing, um, and and it's really it's really hard to understand it because it happened so gradually. But if you look back at Christians in the 1990s, and you look at the Christian churches today, um, they're very different in their beliefs, in their practices, in their goals, in their ambitions. Uh, so so something has happened, and and I don't think I fully understand the dynamics of all the events that happened uh, that were the result of 9-11. Um, but we're gonna read this here. So this is overthrown, um, this section. When the law of God is made void, the church will be sifted by fiery trials and a larger portion than we now anticipate will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Selected Messages, Book 2, 368. The great issue near at hand will weed out those whom God has not appointed, and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter reign. Selected Messages, Book 3, 385. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. So here Jeff is using quotes that are talking about uh, almost appears to be contradictory things. Uh, this, when it talks about uh, when the law of God is made void, the church will be sifted by fiery trials. So these are in a sense talking about different events. He's kind of mixing them all together. But we know that um, the church is going to be pressured by trials of things that happen. And that most will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now we can see that 9-11 brought about uh, spiritual formation as a requirement for Adventist ministers. So we can see that that it's not the start of it, but it's definitely a way mark in the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But it's not just the Adventist ministers. This was also a requirement for the Adventist teachers and the administrators. Yes. So, yeah. So Adventist teachers and administrators had to take this course. But now when you read this, this quote from the great controversy, mm -hmm. especially the portion that says a large class who have professed faith in the third angels message, but have not been sanctified through the 
obedience to the truth. What is this really referring to? Um, well, when I, well, a large class that have professed faith in the third angel's message, I, I have always taken this as to refer to just Seventh-day Adventists who have talked about Sabbath and, and Sunday issues and have, have, have professed to believe in the Sabbath and that we have to give this message, the third angel's message to the world, but they haven't been sanctified through obedience to the truth. That is, they're not following truth. They're actually going to abandon the Sabbath and adopt Sunday. That's the okay. way I'm taking this. Okay, but let, let's just put this in a much simpler manner. A large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through the obedience to the truth. Is this not giving reference to those that have passed through the experience of the first angel, justification, mm -hmm. have had the presentation to see and understand what sanctification is about, but they have not experienced sanctification. Yeah. And they're paying lip service to this on the third angel's message. So is this not the same as those of the churches from 1840 to 1844 that then came to reject the third angel's message? Right. So what it's stating is that if we are not willing to accept the steps, justification, sanctification, then we are going to come to judgment, but we are going to be judged guilty. Mm -hmm. The sins that were thought to have been given up to go forward into the most holy still remain upon us. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not the condition we want to be in. So these that are giving the lip service because they are not sanctified, because they have not fully accepted the second angel's message or the experience of the second angel, abandon their position and then join the ranks of the opposition. At least that's that's what I'm reading out of this. Right. Now, to try to bring, yeah, that's what that's what I read into it as well, or see in it. Um, you know, because this issue, because this is this is a contention, uh, and we're going to see as we go through our history, an issue that Jeff had to deal with, and you can start to see it already happen, right at the beginning of his ministry, of the different people who he's associated with. Um, many of them are interested in righteousness by faith, right? They're interested in the third angel's message. Um, but these people have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth. And, and they end up continually, you see group after group of people who end up rejecting this message um, and and always profess to be going back to the third angel's message. Shouldn't say always, but the vast majority of these people who end up rejecting this message claim to be rejecting it over the issue of righteousness by faith to a large degree. And, you know, the question is why? Because if you have accepted the first and the second angel's message and you've been sanctified, you should have this obedience to the truth. You shouldn't be rejecting the first and second angel's message. Um, so here she's not talking about the first and second angel's message directly. But when she says, but have not been sanctified through the obedience to the truth, that is a reference to the second angel's message, correct? Agreed. Yeah. And, and, and that's the part that Adventism is not understood, is that the sanctification... That is the thing that allows the third angel's message to bro be proclaimed 
is the acceptance of the first and second. Without the acceptance of the first and second, you cannot proclaim the third because you're not going to be sanctified through obedience to the truth. Is that kind of what you're saying? Well, in, in a manner of speaking, yes. What I'm looking at is that the body, the corporate church, cannot accept the truth for the people. The people individually have to be able to accept this mm -hmm. because this is a personal work. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is many of the leaders have rejected these understandings because they would rather rely upon the traditions of the fathers than to say, this is a work that I directly must accept. I must give up my sins. I must let Christ reveal those issues in my character that are necessary to my salvation that I give these things up so that I can become more like him. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we have to be doing. I mean, on an individual level. And see, one of the things about righteousness by faith, I don't think any of us have a problem with understanding what it is. Like, and I, and I don't personally believe, and maybe people would disagree with me, but that what we need is more preaching about righteousness by faith. Because we, we already know the doctrine. We already know what God is asking us, us to do. Um, but what we have to do is we have to do it. But in order to do it, we can't, we can't avoid the steps. We want to avoid the steps. We want to get to the end point without all the work that needs to be done to get to that end point. So we, we think that if we can just stop from sinning, you know, on whatever level we think that is, then that we have just, a, we, we are now experiencing righteousness by faith. But we know that it's not that simple because we have to deal with the root of the problem. And the root of the problem has to do with our nature. It has to do with, you know, who we are as individuals, the things that we don't like to see about ourselves. So we want to appear good, not just in the eyes of others, but also in the eyes of ourselves. But, but the truth rips back, you know, the mask that is hiding um, who we really are from ourselves. And, and that's, that's why I think that this message, what we've seen happen in this movement is that time after time, that as we've gone through these crises in this movement, that people have left the movement because they don't want to see their sins. And, and their, their opposition to the truth is an avoidance of recognizing their sin. That's why they're opposing the truth. Now, I'm going to read a few more statements here. So in the absence of the persecution, there have drifted into our ranks men who appear sound and their Christianity unquestionable, but who, if persecution should arise, would go out from us. And... I'm not trying to judge other people, but I know that one of the problems that we had with July 18th that, that the people who opposed it expressed is basically they were embarrassed. That was one of the reasons they rejected it. Now, doesn't mean that all of us then are safe because we weren't embarrassed, um, but it shows that our focus was upon self and even this whole idea of vindicating, um, being vindicated was self. And so that was humbling to, to make a prediction and be wrong. Uh, the work which the church has failed to do in time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced 
or withheld must be given under the fiercest, fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. So there's these warnings that we have to give. And, and the thing that has silenced them is worldly conformity. So we know that as Seventh-day Adventists and um, that, that we've conformed to the world. And these are going to have to be given under the fiercest op opposition of, from enemies of the faith. And, and a lot of those enemies are going to be people within Adventism, within this movement. And at that time, the superficial conservative class, and she's not talking about conservative in um, the sense of, uh, you know, what we think about politically. She's talking about the people who are, are superficial conservatives, whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work, will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. So there are those who their sympathies actually lie with the world, with those that are opposed to the truth. And we see this again and again, both within this movement and within Adventism. A woe unto them that decree unrighteousness, dis, unrighteous de decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. Um, so just this reference to unrighteous decrees, so the Sunday law. Now there's this next section here called when and then. When the law of God is being made void, when his name is dishonored, when it is considered disloyal to the laws of the land to keep the seventh day as the Sabbath, when wolves in sheep's clothing through blindness of mind and hardness of heart are seeking to compel the conscience, shall give up Shall we give up our loyalty to God? No, no. The wrongdoer is filled with a satanic hatred against those who are loyal to the commandments of God. But the value of God's law as a rule of conduct must be made manifest. The zeal of those who obey the Lord will be increased as the world and the church unite in making void the law. They will say with the psalmist, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Um, that's from Psalm 119, 127. This is what will be sure to occur when the law of God is made void by a national act. When Sunday is exalted and sustained by law, then the principles that actuates the people of God will be ma made manifest as the principle of the three Hebrews was made manifest when Nebuchadnezzar commanded them to worship the golden image in the plain of Dura. We can see what our duty is when the truth is overborne by falsehood. So manuscript releases, volume 13, page 71. Uh, and then from the General Conference Daily Bulletin 178, 179, there are thousands upon thousands who bear aloft the standard of the world Sabbath, exalting the image of the papacy created by the man of sin. The church worship the image of the beast and receive his mark, even as the inhabitants of the plains of Dura or the inhabitants of Babylon worship the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar has set up in the plain of Dura. Um, so we know that there is this, this time that's coming. And when it happens, then what do we see? What do we see when this happens? What's the then that he's presenting here? Then God's people will be revealed. The characters will be revealed. They're not going to be developed in that crisis. They'll be revealed. Uh, when our nation shall, shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, will in this act join hands with popery and how the Roman church can clear herself from the charge of idolatry we see and this is the religion which the protestants um, are beginning to look upon with so much favor and will eventually be united with protestantism um 
This union will not, however, be affected by a change in Catholicism, for Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. The adoption of liberal ideas on its part will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. So we had looked at this statement before. So has Protestantism adopted liberal ideas? Yes, it certainly has now. And we yes. can see that, that the superficial conservative class are not conservative, they're superficially conservative. They actually are going to adopt these liberal ideas. And this is what we've seen in Protestantism. Now, why do liberal ideas cause us to clasp the hand of Catholicism? What is it that Catholicism represents at the end of time? What, what is a liberal idea? Well, we say left wing and liberal worldly uh, conformity to worldly. Yeah, so this would be Black Lives Matters. Um, LBGTQ plus plus plus, um, you know, and, and it's happened so gradually that many people don't even see it because liberalism uh, often presents itself as, as good, as righteous, in that it's, it's loving, it's kind, it's gentle, it cares about the poor, it cares about the oppressed. Is that true? That it actually cares. No, not at all. There's, Jeff is more concerned about how we're getting ready for the Sunday long. Yeah, Pat. Yeah, Pat, I've been having a really hard time. I can't understand much what you're saying. It sounds very. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is this better now? Um, yeah. Jeff is more concerned about unreadiness for the Sunday law than how it actually came comes about. Yeah, he's focused about readiness, right? Now, this movement adopted liberal ideas, right? Uh, the Omega group. And, and that sort of surprised us. I mean, it surprised me um, that we could have had that, that wholesale change within this movement of such a large majority of the movement to leave just a few left. And even those few that were left actually had a lot of sympathies with the new movement, but they weren't in the position of power. And, and a lot of what liberalism, liberal ideas are about, is about control um, and about power. And, and it's always presented that conservative ideas are the ones that are trying to control. But we don't see that in history. If you understand true conservatism and true liberalism, conservatives are individualistic. They're not collectivists. They don't seem to, they don't seek to solve their problems by an appeal to the collective. They seek to solve their problems by, by individual effort. That's a conservative. A liberal, on the other hand, you gives lip service to what they consider to be good, um, but it's merely as a means to get power to control. And, and this is just historically accurate. Um, and this is what we see in the United States right now is we see, we see the United States, and I, I've been trying to sort this out, trying to understand this. We do have true conservatives in the United States. Uh, but I would say that the United States right now is an extremely liberal culture, both within Christianity and without. Um, we just don't know it. We don't understand how much the revolution of the 1960s affected the United States because we grew up with it. Uh, but these principles take away individual responsibility and put the responsibility for what's happening to us upon others, particularly government. And this, this appeal to government to solve our problems is a liberal idea. 
not a conservative idea. But both so-called liberals and conservatives look to government to solve our problems, right? So they don't believe in true individualism, which, which is a, a principle of Christianity. It's not just some worldly idea. Uh, the responsibility of the individual for himself is a Christian idea. And that's why it's in the constitution. The constitution is not a collectivist document. It's a, it's, it's a Christian document that addresses individualism. That individuals are the ones uh, that are responsible. And this is why uh, the, the founders of the America of America and those that wrote the constitution did not know if, if this was possible to maintain a republic. They didn't know if this, this experiment would actually last because it was, it was dependent upon the individuals uh, having manifesting a character in, that was consistent with the constitution. If you had people who were self-seeking and, 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 and not upstanding in moral character, the Republic could not stand. That was the concern. Um, so uh, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness, from right doing. So why would people seek to enforce an institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God? Why would people do that? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? Just think about it in simple terms. Why would people want to enforce Sunday observance? Why would they want to enforce the conscience? What is the role? What is the, what is the reason of enforcing people's consciences. Well, our um, our thinking about that changed after 9-11. In which way did it change? Well, we expected before 9-11 that uh, the government would bring in the Sunday law as a way to control people. Um, but after 9-11, the fear would um, cause the government to bring in the Sunday law in order to ensure our freedom, but it's actually still. Uh, you point out the hypocrisy of the liberalism. Okay, so okay, so why would let's break this down into a, a, a much more instead of nationwide? Why would you have an individual try to control? the actions of another person. Why would somebody do that? They're afraid the other person is going to lose control and create trouble and hazards and death and destruction. Okay. I don't think that that's the reason um, why people like to control others. Um, there's much more deeper uh, deep-seated reason. It's Who, a spiritual thing. Yeah, okay, but, but there's a mechanism. And what is that mechanism? Why does somebody else try, try to control the actions of others? It's, it's a simple reason. Sinful self-worship. Okay. I, I, yeah. You're, you're not really even close. I mean, maybe in some ways, but not close to where I want to get to. Maybe people haven't studied about what a narcissist is. Um, but basically... Just the other day, I heard that term used to apply to Jeff as a narcissist. Yeah, he's not. So, but anyway... Um, who, when somebody judges another person, 
according to the Bible, what is it that that person is doing? Sitting in the place of God. Okay, that's not the answer I want. He that judges another man doeth what? Judge yourself. He does the same things, right? When people are critical of others, what are they trying to do? Lift themselves up. Okay, they're trying to lift themselves up. They're trying to hide the fact that they themselves are unrighteous. Those who try to control others do so because they can't control themselves. What does it mean to be a conservative? To let people control themselves if they can. Yeah. It's to be, if you are conservative, you believe in self-control. You believe that you are responsible for your actions and you're not looking for someone else uh, to control your actions. That's what it means to be a conservative on, on that level. A liberal uh, wants to control the actions of others, but doesn't want to control their own actions. You know, if we're talking about this, this area that we're talking about. So the reason why, what, what's one of the reasons that uh, Christianity seeks the power of the state? Christianity seeks the power of the state because they have lost the power of what? They've lost the power of self-control under the Holy Spirit. They lost the power of the gospel. So, so Christianity seeks the power of the state when they've lost or rejected the power of the gospel. Because they can't control themselves, they seek to control others. This is why people try to manipulate and control other people. It's because they don't have control over themselves. This is a basic principle. I've been studying a bit about, about how this happens. So, so the reason that Protestantism stretches its hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power is that she has, and, and, and in enforcing this institution of the papacy, she has disconnected herself fully from righteousness. That is, Protestantism is not concerned with right doing. Protestantism has um, concerned itself with power, control. Those people that are the most um, manipulative and controlling are those that have very little self-control. They seek to control others. And this is what happens with Protestantism. It looks to political power and religious power. So when it grasps the hand of the Roman power and then reaches across, reaches over the abyss to clasp the hands of spiritualism, why does it want to clasp the hands with spiritualism? What is spiritualism? Well, it sees power there. Okay, spiritualism is do as thou wilt. It is no restraint. It is not interested in righteousness. Yet, when they seek to control, they're going to use, enforce the institution of the papacy. And, but it's not about righteousness. None of this is going to be about right doing. It's about control. So why does Sunday, why is Sunday a symbol of control? And why is the, the Sabbath a sign of sanctification? What is the difference between Sunday and Sabbath? Well, it puts the collective in opposition to individual responsibility. Right. So the Sunday is about um, enforcing um, 
and, and control. It's about government control, right from the very first Sunday law. It's about control. It's not about allowing people to make decisions. It's not about presenting the gospel. It's using power, the power of the state, to uh, control the conscience. Now, why is this uh, pandemic a type of the Sunday law? Because we say that. What makes it a type of the Sunday law? Yeah, the control mechanisms that have been put in place are astounding. Right. Because if you believed that you are in the right, if the government believed that, uh, you know, there's this dangerous pandemic, all you would need to do is to present information to people and allow them to make decisions so that they can be safe. You don't need to enforce it by law. And actually, the act of enforcing it by law creates more problems than if they had allowed people to make their own choices. Because people would do, if they believe that they were in danger and you give them information, the government should trust that people are going to protect themselves. And if they don't, well, then that person may die. But that, that's person's choice. But of course, in the society that we have today, they want to protect us from ourselves. At least that's what they say. But in reality, we, we are much better off to make our own decisions and suffer the consequences of our own actions than to be controlled and, and um, suffer the consequences of that control because we have no control over that control, if that makes sense. I'm not saying it as well as I would like. Um, here's an example. When you have children, you can protect them. You can make it so that they never have an opportunity to hurt themselves in any way. But you're actually hurting them when you never allow them to make their own choices and to see the consequences of their own actions. Because they never grow up. And they're not going to have the skills or the tools necessary to, to deal with the reality of life. So if you coddle and protect, protect the child, the child doesn't develop and become a full adult. And so what we have is the infantilization of, of the population in the United States. The child may also become a revolutionary to throw off the control. Yeah, because they're, they, they have these, they're like a, a rebellious child, not even realizing the consequences of their actions. Um, yeah, there's a, a Canadian psychologist, Dr. Jordan Peterson, and he, he's written two books, one called um, 12 Rules for Life, uh, An Antidote to Chaos. And uh, the, the next one's called 12 More Rules to Life. Um, what's the rest of the title of that book, dear? Um, yeah, Beyond Order. And, you know, we live in a world of chaos and order. We have to make order. Order is about, um, is the idea of conservative, is the idea of order. Liberal is the idea of chaos. I'm not going to get into the philosophy of it, but there's just a practical element. And that practical element is if you have too much order, um, that's not a good thing. Right? You can't have everything controlled. And if you have too much chaos, that's not a good thing. And in psychology, um, and I don't mean to bring psychology into this discussion necessarily, but we see that this psychology of human beings is manifest in how they try to control others. We have to have self-control. And, and that's what the gospel gives us is it gives us self-control. It's not about controlling others. The church is not about um, 
making other people good by controlling them. It's by presenting the gospel. And that's why we're not involved in politics. You're not going to solve the world's problems through politics. So if you lose the power of the gospel, then you seek to change the world through politics, through the power of the state. And, and this is the problem that we have in the United States, that both the left and the right are really liberal in this sense. And they both are seeking to control others. Now, there is a group that of individuals who see, who see the, res, the individual responsibility, but they're not necessarily either on the left or on the right uh, in this whole political issue. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm, you know, I don't like introducing, you know, philosophy or psychology into a discussion about the Bible, but there is a truth there. There's also dangers in, in some of these ideas as well, that you can make too much of them. So these are, he's looking at these different parts of Daniel chapter 11. So at his steps, so we're going to kind of finish with this part here. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands of the Roman power. And under the influence of the threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So we look at the verse there. So what's the verse say that refers to um, steps in Daniel chapter 11? What is he referring to? The, Eth the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So what does it mean to be coming into lockstep, marching together? Yeah. So they're going to follow in his steps. And, and the rich and the poor. So who are the rich and the poor? I mean, it's Libya and Ethiopia. But who are they? Why, why do we have rich and poor mentioned here in Daniel chapter 11? in a symbol of Libya and Ethiopia? Why are they going to follow in the steps of Rome as well as the United States? They're going to either perceive, uh, perceive um, financial uh, security or just fall under the control. Okay. So what do they mean by rich and poor? What is Libya representing? And what is Ethiopia representing? The rich and poor of the world today. Okay, but what rich and poor? I'm thinking of individuals, but Jeff might have been thinking about nations. Yeah, so I'm thinking about nations, right? So, so we have the United States. It's going to be foremost in stretching its hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. That's the UN, right? They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. That's the papacy. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome and trampling on the rights of conscience. Okay, so we have this threefold union. So where is the threefold union in Daniel 11? When it talks, let's go there here. So oh. this is kind of the thought we're going to leave with um, here. So it says here, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans, that's the poor, and the Ethiopians, the rich, shall be at his steps. So we already know that the United States is going to be overthrown. And, and then we're going to have, he's going to stretch his hand over the land of Egypt. 
And so we're saying Egypt is the king of the south, just like Russia was the king of the south, but it's a different power, political power, that is infected. So he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. So we would take this as uh, this is economic control, the power to buy and sell. And over all the precious things of Egypt, what are the precious things of Egypt? And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. I just don't want to tell everybody what I think. I want you guys to think this through. So Egypt is the, is the UN. We agree with that, right? Well, it certainly is a financial control. Yeah. But we agree that Egypt is the UN, correct? This is the United Nations. Yes. So why do we have Libya and Ethiopian, Ethiopia also mentioned? So what is Libya and Ethiopia? I mean, I know it's rich and poor, you know, the poor and the rich. It's on the national level. Okay. It's the national level, it's poor nations and rich nations. Okay, so. Come together <laughs> under the vote. Okay, so then the question is, who who is that? And why are they represented separately? Why is, why is Libya and Ethiopia represented separately from Egypt? Because if Egypt is the United Nations, isn't that all the countries of the world? I don't want to say it's just a simple Hebrew parallelism where they say the same thing in different words. Yeah, I don't think it's a parallelism. Uh, it, to me, it's pretty obvious it's not. Um, and remember, this is the king of the north. He stretches forth his hand upon all the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Well, let's even go back. If you go to verse 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land, but many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So what did I say that Edom, Moab, and Ammon represent? Apostate Protestantism. Okay, apostate Protestantism. And people escape out of apostate Protestantism. So, so these are, are individuals who escape out of their churches that are going to be overthrown by the papacy. So... Because I, I don't take it as that Edom, Moab, and Ammon escape, but that uh, some, these shall escape out of hand, or some shall escape out of hand, even of Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So I'm, I'm seeing the ones that escape actually come out of Edom, Moab, and Ammon. They come out of Protestantism. And then, uh, so these are what? What is being represented here with Edom, Moab, and Ammon? Protestantism. But more specifically, what's being represented? Or maybe more generally, depends how you look at it. Because what are what is Protestantism? Because we deal with to be protesting the Pope of Rome. But it's a religion, right? So you have these countries. But now we have these Edom, Moab, and Ammon are symbolizing. Their, the symbol that matters here is their, their connection to um, the truth, their inheritance, so to speak. They're connected. They're related to Israel, but they're not Israel, right? 
They're not Judah. They're not God's people. But yet they are going to escape out of this, um, the hand of the papacy. Right? Now, when he stretches forth his hand also upon the countries in the land of Egypt, we're saying that's the UN, right? So the land of Egypt shall not escape. And the papacy is going to have a control over all of the world. Now, I would look at the Libyans and Ethiopians in contrast to Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Because it's Edom, Moab, and Ammon, some of them escape, right? But the Libyans and Ethiopians, these are not going to escape. So who are the Libyans and the Ethiopians? Religiously, even though they represent rich and poor, do they represent something religious? That's the question that I want to look at tomorrow. Um, so I want people to think about it. Because I agree that they represent the rich and the poor. But we have to look at it in a religious context, not a financial context. So like rich and poor spiritually. I don't, like, I don't know about that. Well, I'm thinking more Those who... specific religions, but what religions are represented here? In, in this passage, because we have countries being represented and, and they're obviously representing, um, uh, there's a connection with the religion of Egypt and the country of Egypt. There's connections with um, Edom and Ammon, the countries and the religions. But when it comes to the Ethians and, uh, and the Libyans, we've never really addressed what this means religiously and how we would look at the parallel in our time. Because this is part of Egypt, which is, is Satanism, right? I mean, it's spiritualism. It's, it's uh, atheism. And the question is, who do the Libyans and the Ethiopians, who are they? And how come they're connected? How come they're not escaping out of the hand like Edom, Moab, and Ammon are? That, that's, that's just a, a, a question trying to understand this a little deeper. I think it connects with what you had to say about conservatism and liberalism, but the extremists on both ends still fall into the ditch. Yeah, I think that's that's a little bit closer, you know, uh, to what I'm thinking of. Because when it comes to Egypt, I mean, Egypt is the world. This isn't the United States. And... So there's a reason why these symbols are presented here in context with Egypt. So anyway, we're going to close with prayer and you're going to think about these things uh, as we, uh, we got one, a, a study tomorrow. I want to get through this Sunday law part uh, tomorrow. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for this study this morning. We know that we don't understand all things, but we can see, Lord, that um, once again, as we study what Jeff has written, we can look at the scriptures that he has presented and the spirit of prophecy statements. And we know there's many things that he doesn't see in those statements, and yet he's presenting them. And we can see that those things are being fulfilled around us now. Help us to understand these things, to understand the issues at hand, and how we are to apply these scriptures as we look at the present world events. We pray, Lord, that the sanctification of your spirit um, can be manifest in our lives, that we can yield to you, that we can see our sins, and that we can trust in you uh, to overcome those sins, and that... Um, the righteousness of Christ will be manifest in our lives and not our own righteousness. Be with each person again, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.